everyone, and welcome to episode 256 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. During the Middle Ages, the part of the world now known as Spain and Portugal went through massive political and religious shifts. In the 11th century, Iberia was in the process of evolving networks of tiny villages into the powerful kingdoms we recognize from the end of the medieval period, sometimes by any means necessary. Two of the leading figures in the rise of León and Galicia were Fernando I and Queen Sancha. This week, I spoke with Dr. Simon Doubleday about the ways in which Sancha and Fernando shaped northern Spain and Portugal. Simon is Professor of History at Hofstra University and the founding editor of the Journal of Medieval Iberian Studies. He's also the author of The Wise King, A Christian Prince, Muslim Spain, and the Birth of the Renaissance, and the instructor behind the great courses After the Plague, How Europe Recovered from the Black Death. His new book is Leon and Galicia under Queen Sancha and King Fernando I, which he co-authored with the late Bernard F. Reilly. Our conversation on what 11th century Spain was like, how we know about it, and the rocky rule of the legendary Sancha and Fernando is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Simon, for coming on to tell us all about northern what is now Spain in the 11th century. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Northern Spain and actually northern Portugal as well. Yes, we're going to get there as well. Now, I'm talking to you because of a book that came across my desk, but you didn't write this book alone. So we need to give a shout out to your co-author. So I will allow you to, to take some time and tell us how this book became what it is today. Yes, there, there, there is an interesting backstory. My co-author, Bernie Riley, uh, Bernard F. Riley, who actually was one of the pioneers in the fields of medieval Iberian history. He's really almost one of the founding fathers of our field. He wrote a number of books which were absolutely biblical in their importance for my generation of scholars. And we all read them, you know, cover to cover. They're not necessarily always written in a kind of stupendously readable, exciting style, but as reliable, fundamental history, they were essential. So when Bernie Riley wrote to me, I think it was probably around 2019, it came as a huge surprise and a huge honour, because what Bernie said to me was, Simon, I'm 94 years old, I have this project, it's a project about the reign of Fernando I, which he said, I'm sure you know about through your studies. And my dark secret is I had no idea about the reign of Fernando <laughs> III. But he said to me, I'm 94. The book has gone out to external readers at the University of Pennsylvania Press. The readers seem not to have completely grasped what I was trying to do. And I no longer have the energy to continue this project, to finish the project. So will you finish this book for me? And I thought about it for about five minutes because actually my instinct had been to move forwards in time. I wanted to move to the 16th century, having in fact just written a book about the reign of Alfonso the Wise back in the 13th century. And I was thinking about moving forwards in time to the 16th. This letter from Bernie Riley took me back half a millennium. It took me back half a millennium from the 16th century back into the 11th century which was really, you know, terra incognita for me. I did think for a little while about doing it, but I said yes, because Riley is someone that we all owe such a huge debt of gratitude towards, someone without whom my first book could not have been written, many first books and second books and third books could not have been written. So I said yes. I took it on. The Dark Secrets, which I have revealed once in print before, so it's not that secret anymore, is that I had been one of the uncomprehending outside readers who had initially said, yes, this is a great book, but it needs to be recast, rewritten in certain ways. It needs the mother of all editing jobs. And when I wrote those words as the external reader, I did have this hunch that it was going to come back to haunt me and it <laughs> fell into my lap and it was an honor to complete the project it was very exciting and i learned a colossal amount about a rain that was news to me mm -hmm. sometimes you need that i think sometimes you need someone to say 
that an outside perspective is what's needed to pull a book mm -hmm. together. And what an honor, what an honor for you to be able to do this. It really was. It really was an honor. It seems to me that we do have a debt of gratitude towards the generations that went before us. The normal dynamic of scholarship is one that encourages us to be new, to consider previous generations as a foil to our own far-sighted, brilliant, innovative scholarship. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, there's a certain amount of parasite that always takes place, or matricide, as the case may be. We're always saying, well, so-and-so may have been pioneering, but they didn't get things quite right. And here am I now, you know, moving things forwards. But I do think that we owe a debt of gratitude, a huge debt of gratitude. And while there are ways in which Riley's scholarship may seem outdated in certain ways, you know, he didn't have the same attitude towards gender in the in the Middle Ages that newer generations have, while it may seem outdated, it remains absolutely fundamental. There's no two ways about this. So yes, it, it, it seemed to me a kind of moral imperative to accept and to finish this book off. Sadly, Bernie Riley passed away before he could see the book in print, but he knew that it was under contract. I think that came to him as a, as a great relief, and I hope he'd have been happy with this new envisioning of his subject. I love that. I'm sure that at that moment, he could feel like he could rest knowing that it was in good hands. Okay, so let's get into the subject in question, shall we? So Absolutely. we're talking about Northern Iberia in the 11th century. Can you give us a sense of what Iberia, so what is now Spain and Portugal, was like at this time? Because I think it gets really muddled. And this is something that you get out of the book as well as like people have these weird ideas about what Iberia is like at the time. So just give us a general overview. What does it look like politically at this time? Yes, you're absolutely right. Medieval Iberia is infernally complicated. It's one of the hardest places in the world to teach about precisely because of that complication. And in some ways, one of the hardest places to write about. So I think you referred to the kind of weird misconceptions that some people have, and indeed some historians have. And one of the strange misconceptions or the very durable misconceptions that people have is that fundamentally medieval Iberia was divided in a kind of binary way between a Christian sector and a Muslim sector. The reality is, unfortunately, much more complicated. So let's say there were at least half a dozen different realms in the peninsula in the 11th century. In fact, at one stage in the early 11th century, that number would have been much higher. It would have been much higher because the old caliphate of Cordoba, the great Muslim realm in the south of Spain, had just fragmented into dozens of tiny so-called taifa kingdoms. Those kingdoms then became somewhat consolidated by the middle of the century. So you have more powerful taifas like Toledo, Seville, Saragossa in the north. In the Christian sector, so-called, you have a number of powerful realms, among them the realm traditionally called the Kingdom of Leon, and maybe we'll talk about why that doesn't quite work. You have the Kingdom of Aragon, and you have the County of Barcelona, which is a gradually gaining force. You also have a nascent kingdom of Navarre. And in Portugal, which does not yet exist, there is a hub of power which is very gradually laying the seeds for the kingdom of Portugal, which will emerge in the 12th century. One thing that makes this very complicated picture even more complicated is the fact that in the 11th century, the borders between kingdoms are extremely fuzzy. And if you read the book, you'll see that I've tried, with the help of John Wyatt, who I think was a guest on one of your previous shows, mm -hmm. with the help of the map maker John Wyatt, I've tried to re-envision literally the way the peninsula looks in a way that downplays frontiers, because borders frontiers in this period are extremely fluid. Geographical borders, political borders, religious borders are all extremely fluid. So you often have rulers, kings, queens, 
Taifa rulers as well in the south, collaborating with their counterparts elsewhere in a way that actually sort of seems to us to kind of violate the, the, the norms of religious loyalty. And the single most famous figure of 11th century Iberia, almost without question, at the figure of El Cid, the warrior figure who recently was the subject of an Amazon miniseries. El Cid is sometimes described as a mercenary. That gets at something which in fact was a much broader reality of the 11th century. The fact that people did operate across lines, across religious lines, and that notion of mercenary has been used in, a, in an effort to demythologize El Cid, who has often been mythified as a great Christian warrior. But the word mercenary is judgmental. It's pejorative in a certain way. And the reality of the 11th century was simply that everyone's loyalties were fluid. The kings and queens for whom El Cid fought, both Christian and Muslim, were equally fluid in their allegiances. And it's really only in the following century when a spirit of crusade comes to be much more dominant that there's a much sharper sense of this being an ethical problem, that fluidity being an ethical problem. And this presented a problem for you as a historian, I think, from reading this book, in that a lot of the sources that you have to rely on when it comes to narrative about this time were mm -hmm. written afterwards with this lens of sort of crusading or nascent crusading, right? Yes, that's right. So one of the uh, one of the fundamental sources is a, is a chronicle usually called the Historia Silensis, which means the history written in Silos, which is a powerful monastery near Burgos in the north of Spain. These days, it's more frequently known as the Historia Legionensis because scholars think it was written in the city of Leon which actually took its name from the Roman legion, which had been founded there, created there back in antiquity. The Historia Legionensis, let's call it that, is written in the early 12th century precisely at a point at which crusading sensibilities are coming to be much stronger than they had been two generations earlier, much stronger than they had been in the reign of Fernando I and his wife, his queen, the queen, Sancha, with whom he co-ruled in many respects. So as historians, we need to step back, and Bernie Riley was very adamant about this, we need to step back from the assumptions of that later period. We need to step back from the religious binaries that were taking root slowly but surely in the 12th century, at a point at which the first crusade in the Holy Land had taken off, and so we need to reimagine ourselves, again, in a period where religious loyalties are fluid, where geopolitics is often more important than religious idealism, and where that kind of militant religiosity, or if you like, a jihadist spirit, a crusading spirit, is still something that lies in the future. So we need to step away from the presumptions of the chronicles on which historians have often relied. Mm -hmm. And you have to get into the trenches and start looking at land grants and things like that. Absolutely, instead. isn't that fun? <laughs> <laughs> That's and the Riley, I should say, in terms of those land grants, Riley was an absolute master. He had a knowledge of those charters, those grants of land, those privileges that were granted by many different kinds of people, by kings and queens and bishops and so forth. But he had a knowledge of those charters, which remains fundamental to this book and which was unrivaled. You know, Riley was working in the archives as early as the 1960s, a point before, I mean, obviously before they were digitized, before they were edited, a point in, in scholarship when this kind of work was very much harder than it is today. And it's still hard, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> Riley was an absolute pioneer, and, and that is one of the specific ways in which we continue to rely on his body of knowledge. So yes, we do need to get into the trenches. It's not always exhilarating work. Everyone loves a good story. Not everyone <laughs> loves a good land grant, but <laughs> but I think it, it does allow us, even this very unglamorous material does allow us to build a picture which in some ways is more interesting than the old hackneyed, cliched vision of Christians versus Muslims. So I need to ask, because 
he's looking at this, Riley, especially about your work as well, coming together, synthesized, mm -hmm. working on this rain. So if we only have land grants and they're difficult to work on, why look at this rain? What's so interesting about the rain of Fernando and Sancho? Mm -hmm. It's interesting for a number of reasons. One reason is that Sancha is, in many ways, an important partner, perhaps not quite an equal partner, but a certainly fundamental partner in this rule, in this reign. It was Sancha who actually was the heiress to the kingdom, the kingdom which is normally known as the Kingdom of Leon, which might also be called the Kingdom of Galicia, or the kingdom of Galicia Leon, Leon Galicia, this is actually a real minefield. <laughs> but regardless of what we call it, Sancha was foundational, was fundamental. She was the heiress. She occupied a role as patron of architecture, as, as patron of lavishly illustrated manuscripts. She occupied a role, therefore, in terms of soft power, the soft power of monarchy, which was critical. And the female members of the Royal House of Leon, as other scholars, including Lucy Pick, have shown, the female members of this royal dynasty were also economically empowered. They often inherited significant properties scattered and diffuse as a great deal of property holding was, but they were also economically prominent figures in their own right. So in a number of levels, queenship is one good reason to study this this period of time. I also find it to be a particularly pivotal time, a particularly compelling time, because it's a phase in Iberian history and European history which predates the Crusades. It is more interesting and it is more complex than the binaries that begin to take hold from the 12th century. It's more fluid and all of that, I think, opens up doors for us to really think about the complexity of human relations, the complexity of geopolitics. Of course, every period, 12th century, the 13th century, has its own interest. But the fluidity of the 11th century, the lack of straightforward moral binaries, I think is especially compelling. Yes. And I think it's especially compelling. This is, and I really use this very carefully this is a sort of game of thrones story in that you have all of these siblings against each other like this is the type of thing that people are looking for when they want a scandalous royal story because first of all there's no guarantee that sancho is going to marry at all then right. she marries this guy from a neighboring well he's a count instead of a king right i think mm -hmm. i have that right count of Castile, yes right and then her husband actually kills her brother <laughs> And then they have to rule together. So so give us some of this story. It's crazy. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to give too much away. I mean, people need to read it. But, but you're absolutely right. There is this kind of backstory of extreme violence and turbulence and instability. And I have to tell you that, I mean, conventionally, biographers sympathize with their subjects. I mean, I, I certainly sympathize to a considerable degree with the subjects of my previous book, Alfonso the Wise, Everyone loves Alfonso the Wise. But I find it very difficult to sympathize with Fernando the First. He really mm -hmm. seems to be a, a nasty piece of work. And I, I, I can't put that in writing. It's almost impossible to access the personality traits of, of 11th century rulers. But nothing that I've encountered suggests to me that he was anything but ruthless. Mm -hmm. Sancha unquestionably had a far more sophisticated, far more refined sense of culture. Fernando was ruthless. Fernando wanted power and he was successful. It took, it took him, it took them a long time to consolidate authority. There was probably a great deal of resistance even after it had been crushed. But eventually they do, by the 1050s, establish control I suppose that's something else which conventionally is celebrated. I mean, historians conventionally love stability. They love order, right? We normally uh, prioritize order and, and, and hierarchy as, as positives in our approach to the past. But I think the order and hierarchy that dominated in the 11th century rested on violence. They rested on power. They rested on brutality. 
are the kind that I'm sure you can find in, in Game of Thrones. I have to tell you that I have never been able to watch more than about two minutes of that series. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a heretic in that regard. <laughs> That's probably why. I mean, I, I tapped out of at least one season of that for the violence alone. <laughs> but this is, in this period in history, it, it is a very violent time, at least Fernando's yeah. tactics are very violent. And one of the things I thought was really vital in your exploration of this in this book was telling us how big, well, really how small Leon was at this time. So like, this is almost, almost personal. So can you tell us about the relative size of Leon and how this, how this oh, plays yeah. out? Um, so Leon is the royal capital. And that phrase, royal capital, a phrase that corresponds to the fact that Fernando and Sancha normally were living in Leon itself or nearby in the monastery of Sagun. That phrase, capital, conjures up in our minds, I think, a much larger city than Leon ever was in this period. We're probably talking about a city or a town, really, of no more than 3,000 people mm -hmm. in the 11th century. So a village by modern standards. And we're talking about one of the larger towns in northern Iberia, which is a reminder that the northern quote unquote Christian kingdoms in which there were, in fact, Jewish and Muslim minorities, the northern so-called Christian kingdoms were far less developed than the Muslim kingdoms to the south, the Muslim realms to the south in terms of their level of urbanization. So, yes, these would have been very personal as villages are personal. I'm sure everyone knew everyone else for better or worse. And life and power would both have been extremely personal. The personal nature of power is actually something which my advisor in graduate school, Thomas Bisson, always insisted on. You know, he, he would say, Historians often talk about government. They talk about government in the 11th century. They talk about government in the 12th century. This is not government. This is a very kind of personal power. Everything rests on personal relationships. Everything rests on personal charisma, whether it's enforced through violence or, or through softer means, like humor, for example. Humor was traditionally an important part of medieval rulership, but it's very, very, very personal. Monarchy and other forms of power, deeply personal forms of authority in this period. That probably doesn't change until at least the 13th century. Yes. And so when you see these families fighting amongst themselves, fighting each other, that's the part that always is surprising to me because I have a bunch of siblings and I can't imagine going to war against any of them. But it's the same knowing these people that you've known in the court your whole life and making these and breaking these alliances with them, it is very personal. And one of the things that you mentioned, I think as early as the introduction in the book is the kings at this time in this small region were thinking of themselves or when people discuss them, it's more the king in this area instead of the king of this area. So what does that mean? Yes, that goes back to the question of frontiers. Fernando never describes himself once as king of anything. So when modern historians and other people debate, was this the kingdom of Leon or the kingdom of Galicia in northwestern Spain with its hub in Santiago de Compostela, they're really barking up the wrong tree because it wasn't the kingdom of anything. These, as the kings themselves stated in their charters, these were rulers in a certain territory. They exerted power in a very amorphous, sphere of the landscape. They really exerted authority over people more than over well-defined territories. So sometimes the territories were listed, and this would continue for at least another couple of hundred years. You know, we'd have very long lists of all the places that Alfonso X would be ruler of in the 13th century, Toledo, Seville, Cordoba, the Algarve in the south of Portugal. But ultimately, and especially in the 11th century, these were rulers of people, not rulers of land. That is an important distinction. And I think one that doesn't come up enough when you think about power at this time, people are always thinking about borders, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least that seems to be the impression that I get. And when you're thinking about power at this time, especially this is a time that not only has skirmishes going across the quote unquote borders between Muslims and Christians, but also we have Viking invasions. Like this is yeah. a time 
when it's important to be attached to a power in terms of a person so that they can protect you, right? Yes, and thank you for mentioning the Vikings, because I had forgotten to include them in this already, you know, fiendishly complicated political picture. Yes, the Vikings had also been a part of this scene ever since, I think, the ninth century, obviously arriving in a primarily hostile way, but not always. Sometimes the Vikings had collaborated with local leaders. They had collaborated with the Leonese aristocracy. They, 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 they had become, in a certain sense, one more piece on this incredibly complex chessboard. So there's, there's a scholar in Spain, Irene Garcia, who has emphasized the way in which contact with the Vikings also was very fluid and sometimes even constructive. I'm sure there's a danger of romanticizing this. They were undoubtedly terrifying prospects for people living on the coast. There was a sequence of fortifications that was built against the Viking invasions. But the reality is once again, very fluid. And if anyone wants to learn more about the Vikings, I'm just going to put in a plug for Irene Garcia's exhibition on the Vikings, which is now showing in Santiago de Compostela. Well worth seeing. Okay. Thank you for that, because I don't know if anyone is listening from Spain, but if they are, they can visit or if anyone is headed there. We are going to come back around. Anyone anyone going on the pilgrimage routes should walk up from the city centre. If you can deal with one more hill, walk up (laughs) to the city of culture, Ciudad de la Cultura. That's where it is. Maybe take a taxi. You deserve it. But it's, it's well worth seeing. Well, I mean, thank you for leading us in the spiritual direction, because that is where I was headed. Because one of the arguments that you make in the book is that in some ways, Fernando is the person who will protect the people physically, right? So from the Vikings or from Muslim incursions or whatever they fear, the physical protection is coming from the king. But the spiritual protection, especially in this place and time, seems to be coming from the queen. So what what is the queen's role in the spiritual sort of realm? Yeah, this is... This is a key subject which Lucy Pick, who I mentioned briefly before, has has really addressed magisterially in in her book, which is entitled Her Father's Daughter. And the daughters of the Leonese royal dynasty had, among other things, long enjoyed a very important spiritual role as guardians of the dynasty. Guardians of the spiritual guardians of the dynasty, and in certain ways, I suppose, spiritual guardians of the people. Of course, in terms of the broader spiritual protection of the Leonese, Galician, Castilian population, the primary role would have lain with monasteries, right, as as, as hubs of spiritual protection. But uh, there's a very close relationship between the monarchy and the monasteries, which are proliferating across the Iberian landscape in this period. So both forms of institutions served in different ways as as spiritual protectors. What I found really interesting was the precedent in this region, again, of allowing the women of the royal family to be given rights over the monastery so that they never had to marry if they didn't want to. They would always Mm -hmm. have this sort of financial protection as well as a spiritual protection from the monasteries. And that's something I had never seen sort of as a one-to-one connection before between like queenship and this spiritual land ownership or spiritual relationship with the land and the people. Do you find that this is something that's kind of specific to Iberia at this moment? Gosh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I would say that queenship, as you may know, queenship has become one of the most interesting and most prominent focuses of recent scholarship across the whole of Europe and across the whole of the Mediterranean. So re-envisioning monarchy across Europe, not just as the responsibility of the solitary male figure, the king, but as a corporate institution, or not even as an institution, as a kind of corporate web of power and personal relationships. That's something which is certainly not unique to medieval Iberia. That's a, a that's a a body of scholarship and a, and a set of interests which certainly spans the whole of the continents in this period. Yes, and what might be really surprising to people when they read your book, they read about Sancho and Fernando and their political motivations and leaning out to get more territory, 
they're supported by religious figures for the most part, but the big one that they're not super supported by is the Bishop of Santiago de Compostela. So can you just give us like a brief, a brief explanation of why Santiago is so important to this place and time and Iberia, but then like, why are they clashing? Why aren't they working together? Well, yes, the, the bishop, as he is at this point, uh, the Bishop of Santiago, is an extraordinarily powerful figure. He is powerful not just in spiritual terms, he's powerful in political terms, he's powerful in economic terms. The bishopric of Santiago has become a huge landowner already in this period, and, and that will simply become more accentuated as the decades pass. We're still a few decades away from the reign of the most supremely successful Bishop of Santiago, Diego Gelmirev, who will come to power in the early 12th century, but already the, the foundations are being set in the 11th century. Santiago and the bishopric of Santiago is already a rival hub of power and one that the kings in Leon, a few hundred miles to the east, are extremely uneasy with. So whereas Fernando, for example, has a close relationship with a number of Castilian and Leonese bishops, he never has a good relationship with the bishops in San Santiago. It is a very, very strained relationship. And as Bernie Riley pointed out, there are grounds for thinking that the, the real clash, the most important clash in this period is not between Christians and Muslims, but between Santiago and Leon. This is the power dynamic which dominates in the 11th century. And nobody really wins it. They're still uneasily staring at each other by the time Fernando <laughs> passes away. And I, I honestly can't remember who passes away first, but they're still kind of eyeballing each other <laughs> at the end of the yes. reign. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Yes, it, the, the, the tension will continue for a very long time to come. Santiago continues to be a hub of power for a long time to come. And when I say long time, I mean for at least 200 years. Galicia, which is normally perceived as being very peripheral in Iberian history, Galicia is normally thought of as having descended into a kind of increasing irrelevance by the 13th century. But in fact, this is untrue. Galicia and Santiago in particular will remain economically, politically central to the activities of the Iberian monarchy and Iberian society for at least another 200, 250 years. Mm -hmm. So you would think that they should play nicely together. <laughs> but well, I don't I think for... that it would have been less of an interesting book. Right? <laughs> everyone, everyone loves a good conflict. Yes, Fernando doesn't play nicely with anyone. <laughs> and those conflicts, in, in a certain way, the conflicts continue to exist between Santiago and the powers that be. There are still tensions to this day between uh, Galicia and the central government in Madrid. So one might make an argument that this is a kind of structural feature of, of Spanish history. <laughs> so there is so much that happens during this round, this period. People have to, you have to dig for it. <laughs> Fortunately, you mm -hmm. have done this and you have, Bernie, have done this for us. But I know that you have just been in Santiago. So before I let you go, can you tell us a little bit about what people who are looking for traces of the medieval past can find when they go to Galicia, when they go to Santiago now? Because there is still a very active pilgrimage route, which I think I was talking with Anthony Bale about last last episode, two episodes ago, about people visiting. And this is still something that pilgrims are doing. So if you are looking to find the medieval past, what do you find in Santiago? What's still worth seeing? Well... Uh, <laughs> I know it's all, a big question. <laughs> it's a huge question. Uh, and I think one, one way of answering it is that it's not just Santiago, it's the whole of Galicia. It's absolutely studded with Romanesque architecture. So if you're on the pilgrimage route, take the long way around if you still have energy and, and money and your blisters haven't uh, got the better of you. Stop <laughs> exploring because it's not just... Santiago or even the Camino de Santiago, the whole of the region is absolutely studded with Romanesque monuments and churches, many of which are very little known. So do make sure that you go beyond Compostela itself. Having said which, if you are in Compostela, of course, the cathedral itself is a, is a masterpiece of architecture. 
constructed over many periods, of course. And in my humble opinion, the Cathedral of Santiago would have remained far more attractive if it had not been adapted and reconstructed in the Baroque period. If it had been left as the Romanesque cathedral designed in the 12th and 13th centuries. But beyond the cathedral, there are there are many other medieval and early modern sites. In fact, the council, the city council of Santiago is quite keen to move beyond the single solitary focus on the cathedral and to have people explore. So I would encourage you to go to places like Bonaval, the monastery of San Domingo de, de Bonaval, which is a place where you can also see the Museum of the Galician People and you'll develop a much better understanding of the traditions and the bodies of knowledge which are so deeply rooted in this landscape and in, in these people. Well, I mean, you have sold me on it. <laughs> I haven't been there, but I need to go. <laughs> you do. You do. And as a last thing, I usually tell people where they can go to find more of your work. And you actually told me that people should email you. So if they want more of your work or to know more about Leon, Galicia and all of that stuff that you've been talking about for the last little while, that they should email you. So I just want you to go on the record and say that that's OK, that I'm not just flooding your inbox. No, please. I I, I actually do love emails. Maybe it's kind of like Voltaire. I think Voltaire, didn't he spend the whole morning standing writing at his desk, his stand-up desk, writing correspondence until lunchtime. I, I, I actually <laughs> rather like emails. I know it's not fashionable, but please do email me. <laughs> of course, there is always Google, the master of our lives. If you want to find out more about my work, my, the book on the wise king, on Alfonso, which I've mentioned several times, might be worth hunting down. And I did... Uh, video series on the Black Death calls after the plague, which your listeners might also find interesting. Having said which, of course, if you can't find what you're looking for through a quick Google search, please do write to me. I'll be happy to write back. I love that. It's just, it's definitely not a given. You're a hero <laughs> because this Probably is definitely- Probably an advanced form of procrastination. <laughs> I definitely know this is my Achilles heel. <laughs> well, thank you, Simon, for coming on and telling us all about what's going on in Northern Iberia in the 11th century. Thank you my so pleasure. much. Thank you so much. To find out more about Simon's work, you can visit his faculty page at Hofstra University, or you can email him at simon.r.doubleday at hofstra.edu. His new book is Leon and Galicia under Queen Sancha and King Fernando I. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. I'm one of those fans of taking away misconceptions about the Middle Ages, right? And one of the big ones I always see is that everyone was pious and religious. You know, everyone went to church, all that kind of things. But, you know, sometimes you can find the sources where it's not quite as black and white as that. So mm -hmm. there's this fun little article that was done years, years ago about a town called Soira in Spain. In the late Middle Ages, the Inquisition came into town and they took a whole bunch of notes, which is always fun reading. And so there's hundreds of statements there and there's quite a lot of things that were said that weren't quite as faithful as stuff, right? Like there's the kind of fun stuff where people blaspheme, like usually when they're gambling and stuff like that. There's a surgeon who's like bowling and he cried out, get there, get there. May Jesus Christ never flourish. <laughs> wow, those are big words. You really want to get that bowling ball down the line, I guess. Or the cleric, a cleric, who said, there is nothing except being born and dying and having a nice girlfriend and plenty to eat. <laughs> well, I think there is more than one cleric who said that <laughs> over the course of the Middle Ages, that's for sure. Those are the kind of statements like that. Plus, you know, even some people that were like, Iberia being where Muslims, Jews, Christians kind of all coexisted. There was people that were somewhat doubtful whether their religion was right. Like there was a, one miller named Diego who says, how does anyone know which of the three laws of God are the best? Mm, this is a big question at the time. It's a very fascinating little article. So we have a piece about belief and non-belief in the Middle Ages. Nice. Plus, we take a look at the career of Robert the Bruce of Scotland and the top five battle speeches of the Middle Ages. Ooh, battle speeches. That's really important. That's why they have them in all the movies, right? That, that's right. They should take their page from movie speeches. But, you know, I think the medieval battle speeches, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good. <laughs> something someone should revive before like a corporate meeting or something. Exactly. Yeah. Like, rah, rah. Go get them, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it sounds good. All right. Thanks, Peter, for coming by and telling us what's on the website. Thanks. Well, if you've been waiting for the last minute to sign up for my online course, Calamity and Change, an introduction to the 14th century, this is it. Starting this Friday, September the 6th, every week for five weeks, you get to spend an hour with me live on Zoom, learning about what life was like in the 14th century, how people dealt with the many disasters, and what we can learn from them. And I'll spend some extra time each week answering your burning questions about this, the best century of the Middle Ages. For more information or to register to join us, please visit medievalstudies.thinkific.com. See you Friday. A big shout out to all the people out there making my work possible, whether that's letting the ads play through, telling your friends about my books and podcasts, proudly wearing a five-minute medievalist shirt from tpublic.com, or becoming a patron at patreon.com. You can listen to the Medieval Podcast ad-free for less than the cost of a venti pumpkin spice latte. So if you love this podcast, please consider joining the Patreon community to help me keep it going. You can find out how at patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from Spain to rain, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or X at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, now out in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fantastic day.